we're discussing the Book of Joy by uh, Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. Uh, this is one that I recommended to Paul. We're sort of going back and forth with uh, each other's recommendations. Uh, and this one is, is really important to me, uh, but that will, that will make it more poignant when we, when we talk about it. Yeah, so I, I'm interested, you know, I, I think I knew of the book, but I, you know, I of course hadn't read it until you suggested it. Um, we have spoken about this before, but I'm interested to know why, what your motive is and why you found the book very compelling. Yeah, um, we've talked, yeah, we, we've talked about it before, but for our audience, uh, I, uh, about almost a little bit, a couple of months less than five years ago, I uh, went to the hospital and they told me that I had a big tumor in my small, in my large intestine and they removed it, but that surgery had complications, which, which really, which really came close to killing me. Um, mm. the, the, the doctors were counseling Pavlina, uh, telling her that uh, she should think about making arrangements for funerals and things. Uh, I was in a medical coma for, uh, for five days. And when I came out of it, and before that, when I was conscious, it was the most painful experience of my life physically. So when I came out of it, I was thinking, how could I make sure that this never happens again? And the answer to that was, it won't, I can't. Uh, something like this will happen again, at least once, because that's the human condition, that's mortality. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm lucky, it'll be painless. That's all I can, that's all I can hope for. And that was, that line of reasoning was so difficult that I couldn't think it. Uh, you know, four and a half-ish years ago, if you'd asked me to say that, I wouldn't have been able to. I would have just broken down before I could get to the end of that chain of reasoning. Um, but I heard, that Pavlina was listening to the Book of Joy as an audiobook. Uh, on her speakers and I happened to come into the room while, while she was listening to it and it was Desmond Tutu saying uh, there can be no hope without faith faith is the foundation of hope and that made me sit down and think about it uh, and it was something that I'd never heard, uh, heard before um, my family isn't religious their families aren't religious. Uh, we never talked about faith except as a problem. Um, that, that you shouldn't you shouldn't pretend that the world is other than it is. You should look at uh, the facts clearly. Uh, but here was here was a way out that uh, if I can if I can believe in something greater than myself if I can believe that against all evidence, things will be okay, then I can go on from day to day. Uh, and then I listened to the book itself, the whole thing, uh, when I had my, my next surgery, because there, uh, there had to be another one uh, a year later. And it was, it was very scary because of the previous two, uh, but this, uh, this book sort of helped put me back together. So that's, that's my story about the Book of Joy. When, when, you, when you say it, when you say it helped put you back together, um, what, what came apart? Um, just the ability to to get up in the morning, to take care of my kids, to go to work. Uh, you know, I, I was saying how I, I uh, that chain of reasoning about mortality would have broken me down uh, 
you know, before I had, I remember walking down the street between one class and the next, going to teach the next class and, and going through too much of that chain of reasoning. And uh, the weather was just like this. It was bright and clear and sunny in this exact sort of time uh, when I was sick. And I just, uh, I was, I was faced with the choice of either lying down on the sidewalk or not thinking about it and, and going on with, with the rest of my day. And I knew that that was a, that that was a false choice, that there had to be some third way. Uh, and, and the book of joy gave it to me. Uh, the book of joy said faith is the third way that uh, you don't have to stare into the abyss or else pretend that the abyss doesn't exist. You can, the way I think of it is you can, you can build uh, some planks over the abyss and a ladder and a rope to catch you if you happen to fall into it. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I, you know, my, I'm just thinking about this question of faith. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I, I grew up uh, with faith as a, as a kind of fundamental part of my education and daily life um, in, a, in a very religious family, in a Roman Catholic and in a very religious community. Um, but um, I, I think that, I was just talking with a friend about this the other day, and I think that my sense of, of what faith would do for me is different from what you're describing. Mm. I mean, even as a child, um, I learned to think of faith as um, companionable, um, that faith wouldn't wouldn't protect me from difficulty, mm -hmm. but faith would accompany me through difficulty. And um, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be a rescue in the sense of a prevention, mm -hmm. you know, but rather it would be uh, an, another voice in, in those, um, in the midst of those difficulties. And what I found over, over my life is that um, I think that the other voice aspect of faith is, is, has been for me one of the most crucial in terms of allowing me to think otherwise, uh, allowing me to step away from one narrative for another. Um, faith, as I said, didn't rescue me. It brought other narratives into the story. So that's that's kind of what I what I think about it. And you know, relative to the idea that there can be no hope without faith, I suppose that um, I mean I hear that and I recognize that being said, I I I don't know that that that's my feeling about it. Um, in other words, 
I don't know why I can't, in fact, I know that I can hope for faith. Mm. Uh, uh-huh. And they're, they're, you know, axiomatically, it must not be necessary. Exactly, exactly. The, the idea that, that I, I can't have hope without faith um, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fit with my, with my experience of living. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like saying, you know, God, I hope this doesn't happen. And then when, as you say that, then you, you begin to generate other possibilities. Like mm-hmm. maybe this could happen, or maybe this could happen, or maybe this could happen, or maybe it means this, or maybe it means this. And now I have this range of possibilities, which gives me faith that um, that that other things can happen. Um, so. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. I wasn't so saying I, I, so in a mean way. Yeah, I was. I was encouraging you to continue your thought. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that that um, in these areas, I'm, I'm really kind of reluctant to enjoy that with axioms. Uh, are you, what are you reluctant to enjoy with axioms? Um, I'm reluctant to join with axioms. Uh, to join, okay, didn't hear you. Uh, okay, um, well, but you're, you're saying that uh, if you can hope for faith, then it must not be, uh, faith must not be necessary for hope. And That's uh, what I'm saying, yeah. I, I get you, I understand, I get you. I think, I think, and perhaps here's a, here's a synthesis for you, if you'd like one. Uh, the, um, what I've experienced is that perhaps not faith itself, but the uh, the ability to have faith, um, the the acceptance that faith is a is a, a valid way to think and is a way that is a useful way to think. Perhaps I think that's necessary for hope, because if you say, for example, are we going to have a nuclear war sometime soon? Um, I, uh, people talk to me about this a lot. A lot of people, as here we are in Bulgaria and we're close to Ukraine geographically. And so a lot of my American friends are asking this question and they ask it in this sort of way that's like, please reassure me, please tell me that there won't be a nuclear war, Dan. Uh, and, and I say, well, you know, it, it, here are some reasons why there might not be nuclear war. But then they say, well, here are some reasons why there might be. And we can't we can't uh, fight this battle with reasons. There are always going to be facts and evidence that point toward the worst possible thing happening. And because of the way human psychology works- Or, or nothing happen. at all happening. Well, yes, right? So, so objectively, you can say, there are plenty of reasons to believe that nothing bad will happen. But when you say that, people, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for the other person. They're like, yeah, but, I don't but care that's about the, but, but that's the that's that's the question yeah the the fact the existence of possibilities mm-hmm. um is not so that it will do something for somebody yeah you know it's it's not an operation uh that you know possibilities are not operations that will do something for the other person or for you or for whatever. They're just there. And the choices that we make, um, those are operations and they have, you know, they offer possible, uh, new possible outcomes or the, the, the union with one of the outcomes that we imagine. 